Our liberties we prize and our rights we will maintain. This is Iowa Civil Rights History Podcast, where we tell stories about the contribution Iowans and the state of Iowa has made to advance the civil rights movement. Past stories are being told, present actions will be highlighted, and preparation for the future will be discussed. Here is your host, Eric Nyange. Welcome to the Iowa Civil Rights History Podcast. In 1837, a Quaker man by the name Henderson Llewellyn moved to Salem, Iowa. After he arrived in Salem, he built a house which is located about 20 miles away from the Missouri border. That house he built became one of the most important place for runaway slaves who were coming from the state of Missouri. I traveled to Salem, Iowa today to visit this historic house, which is now called the Llewellyn Quaker Museum, and to learn a little bit about Mr. Henderson Llewellyn. I have two special guests on the show today, Dave and Kath Hellman. Dave is the board president of the Llewellyn Quaker Museum, and his wife, Kathy, she's a treasurer of the Llewellyn Quaker Museum. Also, Kathy's great-great-grandfather was a friend of Mr. Henderson Llewellyn. It is my great pleasure to have both of them on the show today to discuss the history and the life of Henderson Llewellyn. Dave and Kathy, welcome guys to the show. Thank you. We're glad to have you here. We, we look forward to this. Thanks for having me in this uh, historic place. Well, thanks for coming. Yeah, historic house. Both you guys native of Salem, born and raised here? I was born and raised here. We met at college, Wesleyan University in Mount Pleasant. Soon after graduation, left with Dave's career, mine as well. Traveled around for 30 years with her careers and then decided it was time to retire, come home, and it made sense to come here to my family farm. I grew up on Iowa's oldest family farm to remain in the same family. It was settled by my great-great-grandfather, Joel Gerritsen. Oh, okay. And he came in 1837, the same year that Henderson Llewellyn and his family moved here. Moved here. Wow. I'm a native Pennsylvanian, and short story, but ended up meeting Kathy at Iowa Wesleyan College in 1967. Blind date for homecoming. How's that? Oh. <laughs> and uh, in any in any event, uh, my my family is mostly from the central part of Pennsylvania. That's the Susquehanna River Valley. It's not Mm. Pittsburgh. It's not Philadelphia. There's 220 miles between those two Mm. cities. Much of my family is from near the Gettysburg area. And every American knows the incredible history of the Battle of Gettysburg and its significance in American history in the Civil War. I grew up with that. I was often taken to uh, family reunions on the grounds. And uh, my father loved history, So, and, and my mom too. And so it's been with me for a long time. So this little museum here uh, and the history that took place was a perfect fit for me. What did you guys study in college? My undergraduate degree was sociology, and my master's University of Iowa was law enforcement and corrections, and mm. I worked in corrections for my career. Okay. And my degree was elementary education, had a minor in history. So I, yeah. I taught the lower grades of generally first through fourth grade. And Marshall University. Oh, well, yes. I have a master's degree from Marshall University, and that is in reading education. So the last uh, 14 years of my career, I was a reading teacher, working with children uh, in first grade who were struggling with the process of of learning to read, getting them to working within the average of their class. When and how did you guys become interested in the story of uh, Anderson Llewellyn? How did that all come about? Well, I uh, grew up hearing the family stories of my great-great-grandfather, who was a conductor on Mm. the Underground Railroad. As I mentioned, he was friends with Henderson Llewellyn. And so uh, as as soon as they both arrived, they became involved in that. So um, it was actually Joel's son, my great-grandfather, who recorded all the stories of what took place during that time. So I had read those stories. I grew up hearing them. My father would tell about hearing the stories around the kitchen table, uh, and just having a close tie to this home as well, part of that story. About 10 years ago, I became involved with the museum, helped with tours, joined the board, and uh, a project came up about four years later that the porch needed to be painted. So I volunteered Dave 
to paint the porch. <laughs> and so I, I'm I, not I like, sure. I, I like I'm how a, she slide that in. I volunteer, Dave. <laughs> yeah, wait do you hear the rest of the story. So uh, uh, anyway, I can't remember the timeline after that, but now Dave is president of the board. Oh, uh, wow. After that's how painting it happens. the porch. Painting wow. the porch. That's, how, that's yeah. how it happens. You, you know, that actually there's a lesson to that. Oh, there is. There's no small job, man. <laughs> you know, you just start painting the porch, and now you're the president of the board. There is an incredible core of volunteers here who love this place, and they they have really dedicated so much time to it and made it what it is. And and it's really one of the joys in this community is, mm-hmm. is what has happened here. It's 60 years now that this wonderful home was saved, possibly mm-hmm. from, from being raised like the other safe houses mm-hmm. in, in Salem. And uh, it's been all volunteer effort since then to, to restore it, bring it back to health, tell the story, welcome visitors. It's, it's exciting to be a part of that. What was the population of this town in 1837, and what is the population today? Well, the first settlers arrived here in uh, 1835. By the time Henderson and Welling arrived in 1837 and built this house in 1840 to 42, a couple of hundred uh, the town grew and prospered up till 1883. The railroad came. That really grew the town. I think its peak was around 1,000 uh, around the turn of the uh, 20th century. And then again, uh, when the railroad left later on, a few decades later, things have dropped down. Now our population is a little under 400. This house is called Llewellyn Quaker Museum. Why not just call Llewellyn House? What's the Quaker got anything to do with it? Well, because the town was... Settled primarily by Quakers, uh, we sort of surmise that's where they got the name. Uh, the very first name was the Llewellyn Quaker Shrine. Oh. Uh, and so that held true for a number of years before changing it to a museum. But there were also Congregationalists who settled the town of Salem, and they were very active with the Underground Railroad as well. Both groups w- would work together. Yeah. How long did it take him to build this house? We believe the kitchen was built first, oh, uh, beginning about 1838, probably complete, or 1840, beginning 1840, completed about 1842, the, the main structure you're seated in now. Okay. And, and I'm sure they did not have contractors and all that stuff. I'm sure everything they did themselves. One of the interesting trades that was so common in each of the towns was a stonemason, a stonecutter. It was it was a trade at that time like a carpenter or a plumber is today uh, because so much of your building material, material was cut stone. Uh, if you look at the blocks on this, this there, it's amazing how clean and crisp they were cut with with iron tools by stone cutters. I, I don't believe there are any such people like that around anymore. Yeah, it's it's amazing. It's still standing. It's it's got a it was they put it on a good foundation. How far is this house from Missouri border? We're about 20 miles from Missouri, uh, not too far from the Des Moines River, and okay. about oh, 25 miles from the Mississippi River. Was that intentional for Mr. Llewellyn to build the house not too far away from Missouri border? Maybe. Okay. Uh, we do find that uh, this Quaker community and other faith groups, such as the Congregationalists in a little town in Denmark, used to hear a large number of these, uh, these communities uh, sprung up along the uh, uh, Missouri border. Now, you also had the Des Moines River, which was a major water source, and so many early communities were built along rivers, uh, so that may have been a factor as well. But the proximity to Missouri probably played a lot to do with what eventually became this this, this station on the Underground Railroad. Mm. This is uh, one of the most well-preserved historic old homes in in the Midwest that served as a station on the Underground Railroad. You're right now you're in the middle room. There are, there are four rooms on the main floor of a two-story stone house. And we're seated in in the middle room, which would have been a family room, a parlor, variety of things. The Henderson and Elizabeth Welling Welling had four children when they came here. They had four more, so this was a busy home with eight children. And um, the room we're in is right dead center between the kitchen and the and the, what would be probably the front room or the, the living room or the home. Okay. There's three parts that I want you guys to touch on, if we can. There's uh, the main story of Mr. Llewellyn himself, and then there's uh, Nelson Gibbs, and then Will Duggs. 
rural dags. Dags. Mm-hmm. Let's start with the main guy. Who was it? Well, he he uh, was born in 1809 in in North Carolina. Uh, the uh, he was of the Quaker faith. His uh, family had moved from Pennsylvania. Before that, they'd come from Wales, and uh, they were farmers. They were they were businessmen. Uh, his father was something of a of a doctor. His name was Meshach. They lived in the Carolinas. They farmed. They succeeded. Uh, there are two things that happened as he grew up. One was slavery was increasing in North Carolina, and large numbers of Africans were being captured on the coast of Africa, brought to the mm-hmm. Carolinas because of two crops, mainly tobacco and cotton. Uh, this troubled the Quakers greatly. This was not their vision of how you treated human beings. And also at the same time, they learned about some new rich soil in the West, uh, they were farmers, and there yeah. was this vast land intrigued them. They had no idea what was in the West, but the, the vastness of America intrigued them. And uh, the new land was in Indiana. They went there. Later on, about 1835, they heard about more rich soil. This time it's Iowa. And that's how they came here. He and his family came here and built his home, began the uh, local friends uh, meeting, and uh, were, were prominent with his brothers, other Quakers and neighbors in, in settling this area. He was married to Elizabeth. Elizabeth. She must have been a remarkable woman, as all pioneer women had to be. Her name was Elizabeth Presnell, P-R-E-S-N-E-L-L. And she had been a, with a Quaker family in the Carolinas and, and moved northward. She was only 15 when she uh, married Henderson, who was 21 at the time. They had four children in the Indiana. Uh, and then she had four more children here. And uh, one on the way west to Oregon later, which is quite a story. They had a total of 10? Oh, Eight here, one in, uh, one in Oregon, then she died in childbirth. Oh, with wow. number 10. Oh, wow. Why in the 19th century people are having so many kids? Well, I, there's probably a lot of reasons, but one is pretty clear that the entire economy, largely in rural areas, was agricultural, and that, and, and that required uh, labor. Well, in the South, you had slaves. Hmm. You bought and sold your, your labor. Uh, in the North, you didn't. So people had large families. It Infant was commonplace. mortality, too, was pretty high back then. So couples would have large numbers of family to ensure. Being, They're not going to lose them all. You know, lose them all. Oh, wow. He, he moved here. Was it because there was a group of Quaker already settled in this town, or was he one of the first people as a Quaker to move here. Movement to this part of Iowa began about 1832 when Chief Blackhawk, the great leader of the Fox and Sac Indians, was, was chased west. And a 40 to 50 mile strip of land opened up for settlement along the border of the Mississippi across to, uh, along Iowa. The, the first settlers uh, came here from, again from the Carolinas and we, have, we, have, we know all about them. Their descendants are here. Their name were Isaac and Phoebe Pigeon. And um, they built a cabin down on the creek. And after that, there were more settlers. A, a young man and his father named Aaron Street came from New Jersey. They lived in Salem, New Jersey. They helped settle Salem, Ohio, Salem, Indiana, Salem, Illinois. They get here. <laughs> Why not call the town Salem? Salem yeah. And, and the word has a, uh, a Hebrew or biblical basis, meaning shalom or place of peace. Uh, so you will find Salem's all across the nation. And, and in fact, uh, the Street's descendants had a lot to do with the settlement of, of the capital of Oregon, Salem, Oregon. Okay. How do you even know in 18, 1835 who lives in Salem, Iowa, when you're in Indiana? There's no email. No, there was not, but there was, <laughs> there was family contact. The, these families had largely come together from the Carolinas. They, they loaded on wagons and moved through the Cumberland Gap with their horses, their oxen. They settled. They cleared the land. They farmed. They, they, they were very active in their faith. And they established uh, meetings, what the what the Quaker faith calls a meeting rather than as a church. A place of worship is a is a meeting house, and those meetings uh, uh, built community and uh, built relationships. And of course, you married within your faith. Mm-hmm. Uh, so those those people knew each other, and and they were able to communicate back and forth through letters and folks returning back and forth. Henderson Noelle went back to Indiana several times to gather fruit stock or tree stock for his nurseries. So mm. there was there was quite a bit. Of, it's amazing how much travel there was given the difficulty of it, but there was a lot of travel. Yeah. I was going to just add one thing about the Quaker faith, too, that kept their ties uh, going with where they came from. 
many of them came from the Indiana Meeting House mm. that was already established or the Ohio Meeting House. And so ties were kept to where they came from, and the Quakers were great at keeping records. Mm. They wrote everything down. Whenever there was a meeting, it was a meeting, yeah. and they took minutes. Yeah. And so we still have a collection of minutes that mm. go way back. Yeah, uh, wow. They're, uh, they're pretty boring to read, <laughs> but... Uh, that was one way that the record keeping was done. That's how you know the names of who came here, joined the meeting house, and who might be expelled from the meeting house, too. But that's another story. <laughs> they kept everything except the Underground Railroad information. That's right. That, was, <laughs> that, that is not in the minutes. <laughs> Which we know that we we're talking about it. But there was there was a common bond, the, the Quaker faith, uh, I think Pastor Radcliffe, in one of your podcasts, spoke to this very, very well. Uh, the pacifism, the, the kindness. Slavery was so cruel. I mean, there's, there's, you can't put words to describe the cruelty, the harshness, the degradation of slavery. It's totally contrary to their belief mm. of how people should be treated. So it created the horror of slavery actually created a common bond among the people who opposed it. And that probably in some strange way strengthened the community. Okay. It was was it welling already an abolitionist before he came to Salem or by the time when he came to Salem and get, got strengthened with the community of Quaker, that's when he became this guy that we know today. It's clear that he and his brothers, his father were uh, abolitionists in Indiana mm. and strongly opposed slavery. There was one meeting there called a duck Creek meeting and they were involved in that meeting and, and they, they were intensely involved in, in the opposition. Eastern Indiana was a hotbed of anti-slavery activity. Uh, Fountain City, uh, uh, it, was a, it was a route from the south directly north towards a main entry area into Canada. That was Detroit. Mm. So they, they ended up in eastern Indiana. They were at the center of uh, anti-slavery passion uh, in the 1830s and 1840s. Mm. Now, he, he came to Iowa, started doing nursery business. The first time I heard the word, I thought it was the daycare. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> I, Until I look it up, I was like, oh. It's remarkable in his nature and he and his brothers, but they had brought from England the trade of nursery work, particularly in, in the grafting and development of orchards and fruit and berry trees. Pears, apples, cherries, uh, berry bushes. Every, every pioneer farm had to have its own orchard. You didn't, you didn't go to the high V because there was no high V. Mm-hmm. You had mm-hmm. to produce your own fruit. And, and with the settlement of the country, uh, that orchard was critical. The, the early pioneers knew that fresh fruit was, was essential to their diet, to their livelihood, to prolonging life. And apples, for instance, could be stored, could be kept through the winter, could be uh, dried. And, and so orchards became a big business. And he and his family were masters at it. They learned about grafting trees. There's a great guy running around Ohio named John Chapman, uh, Johnny Appleseed. He he really was such a guy. He's spreading seeds. The the Llewellyn said, no, no, no. This land out here is so vast. It's so different. The soil's different. The air's different. The water's different. Everywhere you go, it's going to be different. The temperature, the climate. We need to create trees. We need to develop trees that can withstand high winds, withstand hard, harsh cultures. And they began grafting and they would set out their nurseries. In the, in the lower level of this house, in this basement, he would uh, bring in water through a stone aqueduct, natural light, and a fireplace, and graft small trees in the wintertime and set them out to sell in the spring. Mm. Wow. Now, his father was doing that business, too. Is, is that where he learned from? Uh, yes. The, the, in, in North Carolina, that had been their trade also, okay. among others. But they learned to be nurserymen. He, his... His brothers, John, Seth, William, they were younger brothers. They all learned the trade, and it prospered pretty well in Indiana, and we believe they probably did pretty well because they came here and built the only really substantial house in the area. This is a quite a structure you're in here in terms of its age, its strength. For what it was, most homes at the time were log houses with dirt floors, uh, and this one is uh, pretty substantial, and some of that had to do with probably uh, done quite well in the nursery business and in both the Carolinas and Indiana. So yeah, so he could he could afford to build something because it's it's pretty big house even in today's real estate market. 
structure is amazing. 18 yeah. inch thick walls on a solid stone, sandstone foundation. The stones were cut at a quarry west of here, drug here by oxen teams and, and horses raised with block and tackle. There's been a little shifting over the years, but 180 years, the structure is amazing. The interior uh, walls at the window level are uh, 16 to 18 inches, and they're beveled to, to allow natural light because at that time there wasn't much much interior light. Mm-hmm. Uh, the planning is good, the airflow, uh, so that it stays pretty cool in the summertime and pretty warm in the wintertime. Five fireplaces. These, these structures, we're, just, we're so fortunate that it's here. Uh, that 60 years ago, some some local folks had to vision to make sure it didn't Stays. disappear. Yeah. At yeah. that time, the house was run down. Uh, it had been vacated. The Iowa land value was growing. The land might have been worth more than the building. It easily could have been destroyed. We know that there were six safe houses of various forms in Salem. There's only two remaining, this one and the small one across the street. Okay. So we are fortunate. Oh, oh this one across the street was part well, of that too? Across the street, say... Brick federal style house, rather rather small but attractive, in a style you found in in uh, New York. It was built in 1846 by a young couple, Misera and Peter Collins, who'd come from New York. They were friends of the Lowellings and and were active in the Underground Railroad. We don't know that they harbored Slave. freedom seekers heading north, but we know that they probably helped with clothing, food, uh, in some form. Okay, so is that house across the street also open? Can people visit or not? It's not. It's in private hands. Oh, the National okay. Park Service has affirmed it on the National Register, so cannot. that's good. Okay, that means it cannot be demolished. That's exactly right. Okay. I want to go to his his involvement on the Underground Railroad a little bit. The kitchen. Was that hiding place always been there? Yes. Okay. It, it has. The kitchen has the original floor. Well, all the floors are original through the house, except for this one small room. But definitely the kitchen. The The hatch is is there, and that was built there intentionally for by that. Anderson Llewellyn. Yes. That's one of our key places we bring people. And the hiding place is under the kitchen floor. The hatch, the only part of the hatch that's been replaced are the, the, the leather straps that form the hinge. The kitchen is a focal point here because the groups of visitors who come, particularly the school children, are uh, allowed to go under the kitchen floor. We open the hatch, allow them to go down, and experience what it was like to hide under the kitchen floor. Yeah, and we'll close the hatch if they want, and even we have an electric light down there. Mm-hmm. But we'll turn the light off if if they want uh, that experience. That experience that we talk about the risks that oh, yeah. the slaves are are taking. And then we also talk about the risks that the people... Like uh, the Llewellyn. Like the Llewellyns are also taking. Mm-hmm. There were bounties and rewards established. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, like, for example, my great-great-grandfather had a bounty on his head of $500. If he were caught helping, harboring, guiding a slave, uh, $500... That was, and that was a, lot, was of a lot of money in 1850. And uh, he was never caught. Mm. Uh, our family story is he had a fast horse. Kept him one, one, one step, step ahead. ahead. Yes. Yeah. When you try to tell the elementary school kids of what was going on in 19th century, I don't even think they can wrap their small mind around it. Well, they do get a little giggly when they come out from under the kitchen floor. So Until you tell them they can't get out until tomorrow. <laughs> the light is off. Yeah. Well, we try to we try to get their attention and mm-hmm. and ask them to place themselves in it in the role of a seven or eight year old uh, black child of Missouri who's just had his brother sold mm. mm-hmm. and his mother's disappeared mm. and his father is taking him northward and the only white people he's known uh, have owned his family and now he finds himself under a floor with only a four and a half foot crawl space in the dark putting complete trust mm-hmm. in strangers in strangers and talking about trust yeah yeah it's courageous that's uh, very because yeah. cor- you coming from missouri every white person is suspicious then you come into salem and then boom llewellyn say coming in here it has to be going through in your mind like oh he here we go he's another trap I've always envisioned mm-hmm. that. What was that point of contact when those, when that young family 
with with carrying a baby, perhaps, or coming through the brush near Salem, and the and, and a an Iowa Quaker farmer meets them. What did they say? What was the level of suspicion? How did they know if they could trust this person? The Quaker might have had a broad brim hat on, which was a good sign, mm. uh, but. That point of contact had to be very, very interesting in terms of building that that trust in mm. some fashion that you can follow me to Salem and we'll help you. Yeah, I can't imagine what that was like. Wow. Do we know how many slaves came through here? We don't. The numbers vary in guesswork. We do have one remarkable account that in history that, that helps establish uh, the base of history at this place, and that was... Uh, a group of nine slaves that left a farm in Missouri in Clark County. Uh, there were nine, two adult males, two adult women, a pregnant teenage girl, and four kids. We know their names. We know have a physical description. We know what kind of work they did. Uh, we have a, a description of their, their, the tone of their skin. That is really unusual. Mm-hmm. Um, in your podcast with uh, Dave Holmgren, he talked about the fact that we rarely knew much about who these people were. We mm-hmm. might know a, we might know a first name, we might know that they that that they they now acquired the name of their master or their owner. But sometimes they change their name. We have one nineteen thirty or eighteen thirty nine account of uh, 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 two slaves who escaped in Central Missouri named Henry and Winston, and they changed their name to Jack and Bill. Well, I would do that, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. so, so even the names may not even have been, been useful. Uh, but we do have this unusual account. That was nine. That's the largest number that we know were in the Salem area in one group, nine. Mm. The numbers uh, that usually came were in groups one, two, or three, small families. We don't believe there were usually many older people that made this journey. Probably younger people or single men. But we don't know how many because you didn't write down your name in a logbook like you do when you check into a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> Let's jump to those nine. I think I think that's that's interesting story. How did those nine slaves ended up here? The event happened in June of 1848, and it's chronicled in a legal case, and that's how we know about that. They were owned by a Missouri farmer named Ruel R U E L Daggs D A G G S. He lived in Clark County, Missouri, near Cahoka, Luray. Folks here know where that is. For whatever reason, the nine took off one night. We rather expect, led by the two older men, a man named Samuel Fulcher. He was 43 years old, and a younger male named John Walker, about 24. We believe that Roald Daggs was, uh, he was older. He was in his 70s. He had two sons. He was considering selling some of his property property, meaning his slaves, that was getting more and more commonplace because of proximity to Iowa, they were running off. And it's got to be something of a nuisance. So if you needed some money and they were a nuisance, you sold them south. Well, the farther south you went, the more difficult it would be to get to Canada. And we know when they left, we know the first night they were actually aided by a white farmer in Missouri. There were there were white folks in, in Missouri who were abolitionists too. They just had to be real quiet about yeah. it. Well, they came north, the nine. We have testimony that was provided in court by people who witnessed it. It was it was raining. There were uh, some local farmers that encountered them. Probably, Dags found out they were missing. He uh, dispatched a bounty hunter named uh, Samuel Slaughter, uh, one of his sons, to go after them. He hired another bounty hunter when they got into Iowa, named James McClure. The three of them came north. Uh, they thought they knew where the the nine were in the brush. It would have been very thick brush uh, undergrowth at the time. There, there were no railroads, as we know, in the Underground Railroad, <laughs> but there were trails along streams, and there were paths, and they would have stayed off the main road. The main road wasn't much, but still something you don't want to be on. And uh, working their way north, uh, the, the three, the two bounty hunters, uh, McClure, Slaughter, and the son came into Salem and stayed at the local hotel. They told the local folks that they're looking for lost horses, well, the Salem folks didn't buy that. These guys mm-hmm. were clearly Missouri bounty hunters. The next morning, they went south to where they thought the nine were in the brush. Uh, a group of about 12 Salem men mounted, went after them, and they all came together in the brush. The, the nine uh, slaves or freedom seekers, the uh, two bounty hunters and the son, and uh, the uh, 12 men from Salem. We have reports of what happened. We don't think shots were fired. Uh, we believe there was something of a melee in the brush. 
1859, slaves scattered different directions. When it was over, the bounty hunters were holding just one older man, Samuel Fulcher, and one boy, possibly his son. The Dag's son went back to Missouri. The Missouri hunters said, uh, bounty hunters said they're going to take these two back to Missouri. And the Salem men, Salem men, we don't know who, had the wisdom to say, not so fast. You can't just come up to Iowa and start surrounding up, up yeah. black people. You, you've got to have some proof of ownership because the Fugitive Slave Act, which is, was in 1793, it's what they were operating under, did require that bounty hunters coming after their property they need uh, to, they in Iowa had that. to have some document of yeah. proof. Oftentimes, that was a bill of sale or an affidavit from the owner. There were no, there were no birth records for, mm. for slaves. Uh, and they all came into town, and that's where we met Mr. Nelson Gibbs. Uh, he had a law office here. Henderson Welling and his family had headed west to Oregon the year before. And young Nelson Gibbs moves in here and sets up a law practice, finds himself justice of the peace, which means he's the enforcer of the Fugitive Slave Act. And that day, he would make a ruling that was quite interesting in the history of uh, slavery in southeast Iowa. And he was only 22 years old. Oh, boy. boy. As you see in the house, there's two front doors unusual for a residence because the the south side door led to the residence of the Llewellyn family and the north side door led to what was uh, Henderson Llewellyn's business office, a small area where he would meet his clients. His, his brother had a store in town and they were busy guys. When he had left, that became the office of uh, Nelson Gibbs, Gibbs, the young lawyer. Mm. who's also the justice of the peace. So now the bounty hunters, they come in over here to say, okay, we got to take the property of Mr. The bounty hunters at that site where the melee happened, first of all, they're outnumbered. Second of all, somebody pointed out to them the law, likely, that you, you have to have some proof. And someone likely said, we now have a justice of the peace in Salem, and we're going to go see him. They all rode up the, through the brush and here to town out in front of this building. Uh, Nelson Gibbs, the, the young justice of the peace, would have walked out up on the steps, we believe, uh, he had to make a ruling. By this time, accounts show that there were a hundred people out here gathered, wow. Ang- angry That's citizens who were who were not pleased that these bounty hunters were going to take this man and his young boy back to Missouri. Nelson Gibbs said, "We need to we need to settle down here." And they went down the street a couple blocks to the friends' meeting house and essentially set up court in the meeting house. All the players were there: the two bounty hunters, Aaron Street, who had helped settle the town, agreed to serve in some lawyerly role for the slaves. And after some discussion, uh, it was pretty clear to Nelson Gibbs that the two bounty hunters, McClure uh, and Slaughter, did not have any proof, any document. The okay. son had gone back to Missouri. Perhaps if he'd stayed, he might have been able to serve Show some uh, type of testimony yeah. of ownership, but he didn't. Oops. So uh, the records show in, in a later court hearing that Justice Gibbs uh, used the term, he said, I have no jurisdiction to prove you taking them back to Missouri, meaning he didn't have any any proof that he needed under the law to allow ownership. Him. Apparently, the, uh, the black man, Samuel Fulcher, the young boy, ran out the door. The Salem men had, had horses waiting for them. <laughs> uh, they skipped out of town. We believe they made it to Canada, aided by people from Denmark, Iowa. Uh, we don't know for sure. And um, uh, the Salem men had just broke the law because Justice Gibbs didn't say you're not slaves. He just told the bounty hunters they're not your slaves. Yeah. The bounty hunters were hot. I mean, they went back to Dags in Missouri. They came back here with a posse. We have pretty good written testimony as to what happened on this. They, they threatened the town. They took hostages. They took five men hostages to the Henderson Hotel. They said, you're not getting your, your hostages back till we get our property back. Oh, so they took a... Hostages selling, man. Yeah, they, they took... Uh, kidnapped uh, them, basically. Kid, they kidnapped uh, Elihu Frazier, uh, his son, and, and three other men, and, and put, took them to the hotel and held them and said, when you bring us our, our property, meaning our slaves, we'll give you your citizens. <laughs> well, I, I, I'd like to, for your listeners, explain how we know this. In 1950, records are being stored and cleaned up in Des Moines in some storage buildings. And what was discovered was the very first early handwritten court cases from the newly formed federal court in Burlington, Iowa. Mm. Now, this event happened in 1848. Iowa became a state in 1846. That meant 
federal jurisdiction, uh, and a federal court was established in Burlington. Ruel Daggs later would file a civil suit for $10,000 against the Salem men for theft of his property. That went to court. It was a jury trial. It's a handwritten testimony. Uh, we have it. And it reads as an incredible debate between pretty two strong-willed attorneys, one arguing the property rights of slave owners under the Fugitive Slave Act, the other arguing the injustice of slavery. And everybody testified. We have the, we have the written testimony in federal court, sworn testimony from the bounty hunters, the school teacher out front who stood in a pile of logs and tried to calm everyone down, uh, the five men who were taken to the hotel, uh, Kathy's great-great-grandfather, Joel Garretson, was subpoenaed as a witness. Uh, and and uh, it's a remarkable, almost a modern-day drama that played out in the very early court of uh, Iowa. And it happened because the slave owner, Rule Dags, filed the suit to get his money back and had to describe his property. That's how we know so much about the nine. Did he get paid? Well, they were found guilty. The jury found him guilty of knowingly violating the Fugitive Slave Act by aiding Samuel Fulcher and the boy in their escape. The judge fined them $2,900. This is the five men from Salem. We're not sure he, how he arrived at 2900 Dags wanted 10000 Dags even argued that while the slaves were away, he had to hire and pay people to do his work. He wanted as much as he could get. He got 2900 We don't know that the Salem men ever paid it because a year had passed. Nobody went to jail. They're, they were released on their own recognizance, and there's a good chance that they may have paid the fine, but they also may have turned over their property to their brothers or their sons. Okay, and I'm assuming 10000 was the value of his slaves. He was probably His estimate was 10000 and he uh, lay out what he thought the value of, of, of each of the slaves was. Yeah. And discre- did that, described the property. Wow. He described his property the same way you would if somebody stole your horse or somebody mm-hmm. stole your car. You tell the police officer about what kind of car, any damage to it, what year and model. Well, that's how he described the nine. Uh, And we had the description, which is a very unusual account of nine slaves that is usually rarely, rarely recorded. And it it only happened because of Tags wanting his money back. Is that the only case we know in Iowa? I don't know it's the only case. It's, uh, It's the most detailed because of the incredible detail of the court court case, the record of the court. I don't know of any others. Interesting. Well, thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. That was Dave and Kath Hellman from the Llewellyn Quaker Museum in Salem, Iowa. Stay tuned for part two of our conversation. Thank you for listening to the Iowa Civil Rights History Podcast. Until next time, be safe.